Okay, so it's recording. So I was presenting Professor Mark Kokelberg from the University of Vienna, and he has made he's making a, a, a very important, significant contribution to the philosophy of technology. Uh, but uh, uh, I I would say also ethics and politics, right? Philosophy in general is the great mother of sciences, but ethics and politics. And uh, since I became acquainted with your work, I could stop reading. So, uh, um, uh, so I'll give you the the word now, um, and I thank you again for accepting um, our invitation uh, and to help us think this new paradigm that we are living in uh, on. Uh, this Anthropocene and the question of collective agency and uh, climate justice and a possible rebellion of the climate proletariat. I'm sure that um, we will have many questions after afterwards. Okay, so thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Marta, for inviting me and um, to give me this opportunity to um, share some thoughts from my book and my recent work in the direction of, of more political philosophy of um, um, AI and, and technology. I um, uh, will, will talk a bit about my recent work and I'm really looking forward to the discussion with you and your students. Um, let me try to share um, my slides. Um, let me see, uh, this should be this window. Um, it's now loading. Yes, I think you can see my screen and I will do yes. this. Yes. Um, do you see the, the full screen? Uh, uh, I see the screen and the windows with uh, our... Ah, okay, okay. What I will do then is... Mm -hmm. Okay. Maybe I have to do it differently. Let me try. Because I would like that you just see the presentation. Um, In that case, I do this one. And then if I press here from beginning, do you see now the whole presentation? Yes. Yes, okay, that should be good. Okay, um, yeah, good, good morning, everyone. Um, so as I said, I will, talk about my book and also more generally about um, political philosophy of AI and climate change, um, especially focusing on the global political challenges um, and uh, the, the, yeah, the, 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 the political philosophical problems that um, are connected to that. Um, so this is part of my um, effort to try not only to do an ethics of technology, but also a political philosophy of technology. Um, this kind of takes me back to my um, earlier days as a researcher, um, as a PhD student, and before that, especially as a master's student, um, when I was very interested in political philosophy. And um, so it was really um, great to do this research during the, the past years. To, um, to try to connect political theory with um, questions regarding technology. And um, when it comes to recent work, there is uh, this paper, AI for Climate, so I'm interested in, in that kind of issues. Um, and um, of course, the, the book I will mainly be talking about today, Green Leviathan, um, uh, Green Leviathan, or the Poetics of Political Liberty, that's, that's uh, a disjunction, so I think we have to choose between uh, the Leviathan option and the, um, um, the poetics, um, the, the political poetics I will uh, propose. Um, so what I want to do in this talk um, 
is first to, to say something more general about AI climate and, and the problem of freedom. Um, then in the second part of the presentation, dive into the book um, and then end with um, the call for a more complete philosophical, um, political philosophy of AI. Um, so let me start with uh, climate change as, as one of the most threatening global challenges we have currently. Um, and then the question is like, well, what, what is the role of technology there? Um, and I would like to, to say that AI can yeah, be part of the solution, but definitely also be part of the problem. It's part of the solution in the sense that, of course, science can help us, including data science, AI, help us in um, uh, deal with the phenomena of climate change, such as gathering data on temperature change, uh, help to predict our energy needs, um, help to manage energy consumption, um, process data on, on pollution, on endangered species, on the way that transportation um, leads to carbon emissions. So I think it's very useful to have AI and uh, data science there, also big data. Um, I also think that geoengineering in combination with AI um, is an option that needs to be considered, but I think it's a very dangerous option. But in any case, um, we, we uh, should definitely do research on all these uh, different options of how to deal with climate change. But I do think that uh, there are problems, and part of these problems can be expressed as ethical problems. Um, for example, um, threats to privacy, um, fairness, um, and, and other ethical problems that have been um, partly uh, reviewed and, 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 and presented in my book, AI Ethics, for example, but also in other work um, with regard to um, uh, yeah, more policy direction. I also recommend the work that we did in the high-level expert group on artificial intelligence from the European Commission. Uh, so we have some ethical principles there and a framework how to, to deal with these ethical problems uh, from the side of policy. Um, AI can thus be a problem for climate in the sense that it can um, increase electricity use, um, that it can also help the oil and gas industry to extract more fossil fuels. fuels. So um, next to ethical problems, it also creates, uh, uh, you know, next to helping, it also creates problems, ethical problems, and more generally, um, also um, problems at a, at a global level, if we all are going to use AI, um, in, and, and what that means, like using really big models, um, collecting data everywhere, then um, all this requires energy. Um, but I think this ethics is not enough, and, um, for example, um, as, as uh, increasing publications show, there's, there's huge externalities created by, um, uh, by IT in general, and so also by AI. And I also think AI is, um, ethics is not enough, not only that we need economists and, and, and um, uh, other disciplines, uh, but also within philosophy, I think we really need to talk about politics also. We need, therefore, I think, also political philosophy. And um, the book and recent work is really meant to contribute to that. Um, I started with the topic of uh, freedom. Um, one, one issue there is, um, can be conceptualized with, with the concept of, of um, nudging, uh, because I think like, if, we, if we face, <clears throat> as humanity, this, uh, problem of climate change, one thing we, of course, could do is to um, try to influence, try to change individual human behavior. And we have entire sciences, um, empirical psychology, behavioral economics, um, that are busy with this, like how to influence, understand, but also influence um, behavior <coughs> of people. Um, and then there are two options with regard to freedom. One can tell people what to do. One can have a, a legal framework, for example, that just forbids uh, certain behaviors. Um, one could, for example, just say like, well, if, if, if there, uh, some uh, models are really huge and, and consume too much energy, let's just forbid them. Um, but there are also more intelligent options, less blunt options. Uh, one is to 
to nudge people. And the concept of nudging means that you're going to influence human choices, but without forbidding, um, but by changing the decision environment. For example, if you have a supermarket and you offer um, um, what is normally done, all kind of snacks at the checkout, then you're influencing people to still pick up um, an unhealthy snack before they leave the supermarket. Uh, but this can be changed. We can change the decision environment here and offer fruits, for example. And uh, similarly, one could um, use nudging to promote a more environmentally and climate-friendly lifestyle at the individual level. The claim of nudge people is to say that there is no coercion and that it's a libertarian paternalism. So it's a paternalism, paternalism because you're telling people what is good for them, but you're um, basically, um, yeah, not really uh, constraining them. And in that sense, it's libertarian. Um, it's, it's offering crutches that support what we should want. Um, but this paternalism basically is still um, failing to respect human autonomy and rationality because what this nudging is about is that you use a shortcut. Um, you try to influence people without um, uh, going through the conscious rational part of us, but you're bypassing that and um, uh, by bypassing, bypassing uh, rational decision making, you're not really taking people serious as autonomous um, persons. Um, but of course, this is an option that one could use then for good purposes. Um, it's just that, that ethically and politically speaking, this covert manipulation of citizens' choices is, um, is not good, right? And one could argue uh, against it by saying like, well, in a liberal democracy, this kind of covert manipulation of citizens by the government uh, and also of consumers by big, big companies has no place. So that's a choice to make there. And um, I think with these principles, we can um, say why, is, why it is problematic. Um, now one could say perhaps it's a necessary evil and I come back to that. Um, so there, there is a kind of um, uh, temptation, if not pressure, if you really take seriously the climate problem to say like, well, we need to um, do some nudging to influence people. Um, but there is a, um, yeah, a, a gliding, um, 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 th th there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a danger that it, it, it becomes a more authoritarian option. Um, I will come back to that when I go into the book. Also, next to freedom, there are other values uh, that are and, and principles important, especially justice when it comes to climate change. So um, we can say like, yeah, as humanity, we have to do something about climate change. But in fact, when we look more closely, that some people um, are more vulnerable than others to climate change. And that creates a problem of um, yeah, distribution of the benefits and harms of climate change, change which can be from the side of political philosophy, um, be framed as a, as a problem of justice. Um, in particular, I think we can talk about global justice and intergenerational justice. Um, and so um, this, this next to freedom, of course, is also very important um, and, and political philosophy can help there. Um, and I think if we fail to, to, to address those problems, um, we will um, yeah, find ourselves in, um, in really um, yeah, very, very uh, hard circumstances for some people and also uh, very, um, yeah, very much political instability in terms of struggles between people. And a Comas report of 2010, a decade ago, already warns for um, uh, political and ideological struggles there. So when, when we come to think about um, things like uh, um, rebellion, protest, uh, something that you and your group are interested in, then, then this is something to be considered. And I think today we are, we are not really aware of that, how, um, how much this climate change issue will also interfere in, uh, and, and, and shape the political and ideological struggles of the 21st century. 
Um, so I think this raises really very political questions about who should change lifestyle in order to save whom, right? So, uh, for example, dealing with flooding, should young people in the West then live more climate friendly to save people in the global south? Um, what if they bear the cost in terms of freedom? Is that justifiable? Um, uh, and to what extent? And um, if we think about using technologies such as AI, even uh, uh, geoengineering, who will benefit from that? Uh, maybe only the people that that invest in it, so the, the, the West, the North. And what, what does it mean for people living in the uh, global South? Um, also, the question of priority, like to what extent is yeah, uh, AI and climate change a kind of Western hobby? Um, to what extent is it is it really a priority? Um, there's a danger of neo-colonialism where um, yeah measures are taken in the in the West and the North and then have this influence elsewhere without actually uh, people in the global South have a say in this. So uh, philosophers um, in the transhumanist direction, for example, who always think about the future of humanity are really afraid they think about the future of the um, global North. And um, so the question is, how can we um, yeah, be more sensitive uh, in general people in philosophy of technology in uh, thinking about the future of technology? How can we be more sensitive to that kind of issues? Um, and this will become more and more uh, pressing, not only climate change, but in general, the, the whole effects of human intervention um, in the geology and climate of the planet, in the uh, ecosystems of the planet, I think, um, in terms of the, the what is often called the Anthropocene, uh, the idea that we really um, influence as humans the, 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 the whole geological uh, situation of the planet. Um, given given that kind of perspective, I think these kind of political questions and ideological struggles will become more important. Um, and that's about like who who has the benefits and the harms, but also who should deal with the ethical and political challenges. Um, and um, one could say that we are all responsible, but maybe that some of us have more responsibility than others. And so we should address that. And I think political philosophy can, can help with that. Uh, and of course, uh, that, that also relates and um, who should deal with it relates to the question like, you know, do we uh, want democracy? If so, what kind of democracy and what kind of democracy is possible? And what is democracy really about? Is it more about uh, rational thinking and discussion? Or is there also, um, next to a kind of Habermasian um, uh, idea about trying to, to reach um, uh, consensus about things. Is there also room for, for political um, struggle and for, for more antagonistic views like Chantal Mouffe proposed, for example, um, a, a philosopher who comes from, from Belgium, the same country where, where I grew up. Um, so, Within political philosophies, there, 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 there are a lot of different views and, and, and different theories, uh, which are often ignored by by, um, by uh, people in philosophy of technology. And I wanted to do something about that. Um, and I want to um, yeah, contribute to thinking about technology, thinking also about what kind of education do we need um, for a, a politically sensitive um, uh, thinking about technology. And um, so the book, Green Leviathan, um, or the Poetics of Political Liberty, is, um, is part of that effort. Um, and um, so what, what is <clears throat> doing the book is I start with a story about, um, yeah, you know, a green authoritarian system where, um, yeah, th there is, um, uh, where society has moved in a very, green direction, so green politics, environmentalism has won, but at the cost of freedom. And so the book is all about that, thinking about that and, and trying to stimulate people to think about that, like what kind of choices do we have there um, for the technological future? Um, because one, one possibility is really authoritarianism and um, it's not something that I want, it's not something that uh, most people want, 
um, in, in the West and elsewhere. But I think it's it's um, it's good to see the the threat and to think through this kind of um, challenges by using political philosophy. And um, so Thomas Hobbes, um, in uh, already um, in in the seventeenth century, um, was thinking about this kind of problems. Um, in a sense that he saw um, a lot of political struggle and and thought that an authoritarian ruler um, should put those struggles down, should bring peace. Um, and of course, that is at the cost of liberty, but it's also um, uh, saves lives. Um, so this kind of um, uh, balancing, this kind of negotiation, this kind of um, trade-offs, um, could also be made in the case of climate change. And, and we see that, of course, some um, political regimes uh, go more into that direction. Um, for example, in China, where it's like um, um, the US chooses a totally different option, total libertarianism, where, um, um, where, where nothing is done, basically, or very little is done uh, towards dealing with climate change. Um, so I think uh, the rest of the world and, and these countries too, in the end, will have to navigate between these two choices, between um, total libertarian um, uh, politics and, and total authoritarian. Um, and uh, there is a philosophical, theoretical temptation of going the authoritarian way. I think it's good to, if we are against authoritarianism, to understand the temptation um, that is there for philosophers to go in that direction, because um, if we look in our Western um, culture, there always has been that temptation. And someone who, who, who really um, expressed that temptation very clearly, I think, is, is Dostoevsky in his um, uh, book, The Brothers Karamazov, which includes um, a section where which has a story on its own, a narrative about uh, the Grand Inquisitor um, who um, uh, puts Jesus on trial again in the medieval times and says like, well, um, you know what, uh, you, you want freedom for the people, but actually people don't want freedom. Uh, we, the church, um, have uh, suppressed people um, in, 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 in Spain and elsewhere. We, we, we have suppressed them to um, uh, for the per for their own good, because they cannot deal with freedom. Um, and so in the book, I analyze that story again in the light of uh, climate change, because I say like, uh, well, there's the temptation of the green grand inquisitor, one could say, um, uh, who, for example, uh, not just people, right? Because uh, a green grand inquisitor could argue that um, because people cannot deal with freedom, they basically messed up the planet, they need to be for their own good. They need to be nudged. Their their own um, capacities for freedom need to be bypassed because they basically don't use them, and uh, they need to be influenced at a at a subconscious level um, by means of of these um, new technologies like AI. So um, I think both Hobbes and, and Dostoevsky provide two. Um, bleak stories um, to um, nightmares in a way, uh, but nightmares that are well worth analyzing because they are parts of our thinking in the end. And so I think Western democracy is highly vulnerable, not only in practice, but also theoretically uh, to this Hobbesian and, um, and uh, inquisitor type of threats um, because they, yeah, in, 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 in that thinking, uh, it, it's presented as if we have that dilemma, right? So people arguing for libertarian freedom, they say, well, it's us or them. It's like either you, you accept full uh, negative freedom, don't tell me what to do, um, like in the US, don't tell me what I should do in terms of guns, I just buy guns. Um, that's a libertarian argument. Uh, and and, and the, the argument is that if, if you don't give us that freedom, the alternative is uh, authoritarianism, uh, for example, in the form of communism. So they, they say like, yeah, uh, the choices between libertarianism and authoritarianism, and, and that, that kind of dilemma is, is presented again and again 
Um, also, again, I think in the work of Zaya Berlin, who is not, um, you know, who, who is not a, an American gun-bearing um, libertarian, but is is definitely an important thinker in the history of liberal uh, thinking about liberal philosophy, and who again presents us with that dilemma, saying like, well, you know, there's either this um, full negative freedom and 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 also uh, what he calls uh, positive freedom. And otherwise, you have authoritarianism, which which comes from positive freedom in the end. Um, I will not go into detail there, but the, the the problem is again presented as a dilemma. There's nothing in between freedom and authoritarianism. Um, we also see this dilemma in the questions regarding technology, because there the, the uh, technologies, for example, in a Californian context. And increasingly, they move also to other states in the U.S. There, there is a very there's this push for techno solutionism for solving everything with technology, which is almost a kind of authoritarian thinking. And at the same time, there is a there's a kind of easy libertarianism. Um, so the, the whole discussion about technology moves within that space. Is is either about like the the genius entrepreneur who's going to save uh, uh, humanity by transplanting the whole of humanity or consciousness at least to, to Mars um, and has this kind of techno solutionist drive in the form of a you know kind of a follows type of you know um, trying to 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 to, um, to put through technology by, by any means um, and without you know not in a democratic way at the same time there's a the, you know, when we think about use of computers and, and devices, there is a libertarianism. It's all, all about the people's choices. And um, so I would say that that the current development of technology moves within that political uh, space, which is a which is a yeah, you know, a, a space is div divided up in, in two spaces, and there's no space in between. Um, and I do think that that we need. Uh, to open up a, a third space there, and um, uh, and there have been thinkers who have been contributing to that, um, and and I think we can um, contra Berlin, who had a notion of positive freedom, which he connected to authoritarianism. I think we can have a notion of positive freedom in the sense of a, a kind of freedom that is not just about negative freedom, about doing what you want. It's not just libertarian. But it it also is much richer, and it's that kind of notion that I try, you know, that my book tries to contribute to. And uh, there are various in sources of inspiration. For example, Martin Nussbaum's work, uh, Marxism, and environmentalism, posthumanism, um, and and in the end, I also respond to Hannah Arendt. So let me go in more detail how I try to open up the space between, on the one hand, um, extreme libertarianism, and on the other hand authoritarianism. So one um, um, uh, uh, source of, for, for a more positive um, notion of liberty that's not just about doing what you want, I find in Rousseau. Um, uh, Jean-Jacques Rousseau is a, a French thinker, um, 18th century, and um, is known for uh, various reasons, and um, um, one reason is actually that he's often um, credited with with being a, a kind of proto-romantic. So, if we think about a discussion in environmentalism, for example, that uh, Rousseau is relevant. But but uh, one of the other main reasons why it's known is for his um, 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 view on in, in, in his contribution to political philosophy. Um, I, I will not explain everything about Rousseau, but but um, one and his notion of freedom, uh, which I wrote my my master thesis on, um, is is you could say a kind of positive freedom, namely freedom of of self rule. It's it's not about doing what you want, but it's about um, in his words, kind of more submitting to the general will. Um, so it's self-rule, but at the level of the police of the city, where citizens 
um, rule themselves rather than um, submitting to an authority. Um, so it's negative in a sense of like not just doing what the tradition wants, what the, um, uh, the church wants, what what religious leader wants at, at the time, but it's it's about um, yeah what we now call democracy. Um, but yeah, it, it, it's it's not the same as doing what you want because it's it has to do with um, a kind of republican ideal of deliberation, which later is taken up by Habermas and others. Um, and and yeah, it's freedom as, as self rule as autonomy, which at the individual level means like you, that you're you master of your desires, which can be found in the, uh, in the ancients already. Um, but but it's also like at a collective level self rule. Another idea is from Sen and Nussbaum, um, Amartya Sen and Marta Nussbaum developed a capability approach where they say like, well, um, in, in economics, in development economics, you, you don't, um, it's not just about giving people material things or, or income, it's also about um, trying to develop their capabilities as humans, uh, it's about their human flourishing. Um, and then I also find um, that can also be put as, a, as an idea of freedom. Um, it's, it's not a freedom to do what you want, it's a freedom to uh, develop yourself, to flourish, to, to, um, to achieve what you as a human, uh, to, to, to develop your, your own capabilities as a human. Um, and that ranges from, from being healthy to, uh, to being a social being relating to other people. Um, and I would add uh, some environmental capabilities too. I also argued um, that, that some technological uh, dimension should be added to capabilities. Then there's this Dewey who, um, um, after Rousseau, um, talked about participative democracy and also improvisation and experiments, who, who, um, who looked at the sciences especially, and later Fesmeyer interpreted more from the side of, of jazz improvisation, but um, Dewey himself looked at the sciences and thought that democracy is about experiment also, that, that we should use the methods of science also in democracy. Um, an interesting idea about democracy there. Yeah, again, it's a freedom that you have as citizens to, to be educated, the freedom to participate in democracy is again different than the freedom to bear guns or the freedom to, um, to yeah, make the, the life of your neighbor um, uh, difficult. McIntyre then, uh, is more from the communitarian side, also things of human, of human flourishing like Nussbaum, but um, stresses our dependence as human beings and our, yeah, it goes back to Aristotle, we're, we're political animals, we're, we're animals that are meant to live in a community. And here freedom is, means again something different than doing what you want. It means to, uh, as a dependent person, as a, as a communal person, to, um, to flourish within a community and contribute to the community. Uh, so again, a different idea of freedom and an idea of freedom that connects to, to the ancient idea of the good life and that, that I would say uh, relates also to some notion of a common good. Uh, without necessarily meaning collectivism like in, in, in um, communism as it existed. Uh, but, but yeah, it's about common good. It's not just about the negative liberty of uh, individuals. It's not about doing what you want. So together uh, in the book, I sort of build up this more positive notion of freedom that's uh, not necessarily <coughs> authoritarian as Berlin argued, uh, and nevertheless can, uh, I think it's more, yeah, more ready to, to deal with the problems we have in, in the 21st century. Um, then, um, when, so if we come to these problems again, with climate change, um, we, we uh, have to think also about how to deal with that on a global level. And uh, the way people think about, about, about what, you know, Anthropocene and also about climate change, who has you know, done climate change, who, uh, who are the, the the actors often it says like yeah humanity is a geological force um, for towards the Anthropocene um, or we as humanity have to deal with climate change and in a sense that's true because we we have to deal with it at the global level um, but the we should be specified because behind the the we behind the kind of in, invisible hand that has caused climate change I think 
there are many visible hands. So we, as I think from a critical theory point of view, we should make visible the hands, um, uh, the many hands that have contributed to climate change. And then it becomes clear that some people have contributed more than others, uh, that there is an economic system, a social economic system uh, called capitalism, um, that, that there is a political economy of climate change. So we can, we can use marks there. Um, and starting from that um, question, like who, who actually are the visible hands um, and, and who has to deal with it and, and what will happen now in terms of ideological struggles um, around climate change, I thought like, well, probably what will happen is that, that we will have class struggles again, um, but not cl um, just in terms of classes that were defined by Marx, um, but uh, with what I call climate classes, um, so not classes defined in terms of ownership of the means of production, the one are the owners, the capitalists, and the others are the non-capitalists, but rather um, those who benefit and those who suffer from climate change. And so there we can see that there is a, a climate class that benefits from uh, climate change uh, and a class that suffers from it. Um, and uh, then based on that, one can ask the question like, well, what about rebellion, protest, um, and, and, and class struggle then? Um, so it could be that, that through climate change, we create a kind of climate pro proletariat, um, people who have um, uh, nothing to lose in the end anymore because they get poor and their life is threatened by climate change. Um, they will rebel against those who benefit. And so this is, um, I think, yeah, trying to theorize the, the new ideological struggles in the 21st century by, by using um, Marx, but also by going beyond Marx in the sense that, that ownership of production is not going to be the only thing that matters. Um, and so I think we have to, from an environmental and climate point of view, we have to rethink critical theory and, and make sure it's uh, ready for those challenges. And next step um, I took in the book is saying like, well, so far uh, we only talked about humans, but what about non-humans? So here the question is like, who is actually part of the body politic, the political body? Who is part of the collective that we're talking about? Because Yes, the, the Western tradition has it that it's only about humans, um, and that's already in Aristotle, um, but we have already decades of environmental thinking that goes towards more non-anthropocentric views. Um, we have arguments in animal ethics and uh, uh, animal, uh, I would say, political philosophy. Uh, there's not much, but there is some. For example, Donaldson and Kim Lika, um, uh, say that you know animals that are domesticated they are part of our society and they have interest and uh, through our um, cooperation with them and, and their their integration in our society we also have to respond to their interests and they uh, have to be made citizens um, this also is in line with uh, my earlier contractarian argument for including some animals um, into the social contract and, and we might think about relational term in, in terms of moral status, because um, this, uh, giving this, this political status of citizens to animals, to some kind of animals, um, it's, it's based in a way on an argument of, about relations. It's not based in an argument about, um, about properties as such, such as consciousness or not. It's, it's, it's based on, well, you know, these, these animals are, are part already of our society. We relate to them already. And based on that, we're going to give them um, a certain political status, a citizenship, perhaps a second class citizenship. And then there, there are more people who have questioned the, uh, the borders of the body politic. Uh, for example, Bruno Latour in his work famously has argued that uh, things could also be or are already part of a kind of non-modern um, constitution. And Donna Haraway has uh, used various uh, metaphors such as cyborgs, compost, uh, to, to think about like, yeah, how can we also um, in, have a more inclusive politics 
Um, and um, an interesting term she uses uh, is, is simple as is the, the, the making with others, we make together the political, one could say. And um, this is the, something I pick up later in, in the book. Um, what I also see in Haraway and partly in Latour already is, um, is a more processed view of um, uh, philosophy of, uh, of political philosophy and, uh, and philosophy of technology. And this is something I'm also working on. Um, for example, recently in thinking about time and AI, uh, in thinking also earlier about innovation processes. So um, I think if we combine this kind of inputs, we get to a view where um, a, a different view of politics altogether. And um, towards the end of the book, I gesture towards what I call a poetic political project, where uh, politics is, is a process, politics is a kind of becoming, and it's, um, it, it's more specifically a, a becoming in the sense of a making, uh, uh, and, and even more specifically, a making of new common worlds. So the poetics is the making, the techne, and uh, yeah, it's, it's directed towards how can we make a common world? I think that should be the, um, the political question. Um, and um, I uh, developed that um, already a little bit, um, should, be, should be developed more. I, I developed this already a little bit in, in dialogue with Hannah Arendt, who in her book, The Human Condition, defined politics in the way the ancients defined it, namely as action, as opposed to, um, the, to technique, to making, and as opposed also to labor. And, and I think that's a very, um, it's an aristocratic uh, definition of politics, and we should get finally beyond that. We should have a politics that includes the household, includes the metabolism of labor, and that includes also uh, the techne, and, and in that way includes also the, the, um, the technologies. And, and, and that's why I started talking about political technologies. So to give you an, an, an impression of that, uh, let me read from, from the book very briefly um, what this poetic political project is about. So what I wanted to um, just to watch, what I wanted to convey is the idea that, quote, creating the conditions for political freedom is not a matter of making yourself free from creating things and from actively relating to one's environment as the citizens of the ancient polis did when they engaged in politics by leaving behind their household, their women, their slaves. Politics as a kind of negative freedom, like leave me alone, basically, I do my things. And um, instead, that kind of new concept of politics demands technological action, creation, and transformation with the aim of making and remaking the collective, and preferably in an inclusive way. And politics is then not just a matter of talking to one another. It's not just a matter of, quote, declaration, agreement, and discussion, or the quasi-legalistic making of a social contract. Um, which is all a matter of words, it also requires political technologies and infrastructures that help to make the new common world. It requires political sciences that help to gather and sustain the new collective. That's a, a reference to Latour in a way. And Marx did not materialize politics too much. He did not materialize it enough, right? In the sense that um, technologies and the sciences all this material stuff is also political. And um, so, uh, quote, political, politics may well be about communication, as Habermas argued, um, but communicative action um, is not only a matter of mutual deliberation and argumentation, that is the performative use of words, technologies and the sciences next to the arts can also be communicative. And um, that, that is, quote, they can make community and enable cooperative action, unquote. So here I, um, in, a, in a quite dense paragraph, I uh, respond to Habermas, right? Uh, saying that this communication should be, should be uh, expanded. So it's, it's, um, it's also not only um, a, a poetic, but also uh, in the sense of making, but also a communicative view of politics, but the communication uh, concept is, is 
widened. Um, you know, uh, it's not just this communication that Arendt talks about um, and, 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 and Habermas talks about because it's not just about words. It's, it's a communication, a making of community um, uh, by using technology also. Uh, and that, of course, connects them to my, my work on words and things and to um, thinking about yeah, more uh, process views and more um, yeah, linking to, to work in STS and so on. That's more uh, about material and uh, materialization. So linking back then also to, to, um, to higher way, um, I pick up the symbiosis, this making together, um, and call for yeah, a project of technologies that um, uh, make us aware that we are all in this together, that we're together in this, uh, have this problem of climate change. So that's also the global dimension. It's also, um, yeah, interesting to think about AI making us aware by, by enabling this kind of analysis of data that, that yes, that there is this um, global problem and that, um, that, that we are all, all interconnected. So in that sense, AI in the sciences by showing, uh, ecological sciences also by showing that we are um, much more interconnected um, than we thought we were. Um, I think that's, that's political, that's a political science, right? In, in the Latourian sense, I think it's, it's a political science um, because it's, it's, it makes also a political statement. Um, it, it means that, yeah, the body politic is wider than humans. Um, and, and we have the, the, this, this uh, interconnectedness um, and, and there's a potential to create community, to communicate um, also at the global level. So um, in that sense, the sciences, including technologies and science like AI are, are important. And we can also, um, yeah, I think it encourages us to think also about um, other um, symbiotic political technologies um, that help us to build a new political collective around the climate crisis. So this, um, I think, gives more um, theoretical substance to my call to have global action uh, when it comes to both climate change and AI, and also um, shows again that, yeah, uh, political philosophy can help us uh, to think about these issues to think through these issues and to um, at least explore different solutions also. Um, at least uh, think about concepts that could stimulate different solutions than the usual ones, uh, different solutions than the libertarian um, uh, politics of technology and different solutions than the techno-solutionism. Um, um, uh, because this making together of common world is not something that's um, that's easy and quick. It's not something that only requires the sciences. Um, it means that we, we first really have to rethink what we mean by politics and that we yeah, have to, to think about how to make this building of a common world um, in a way that, that connects what is usually called politics and what's usually called technology and science, that sees that science is political, but also that sees that, um, uh, you know, so that goes towards Latour, but, but also sees um, politics more uh, um, in a material way, as STS has argued, but also politics as this um, yeah, um, project of, of a common making, of communicating, of making community, um, of working towards the, the common good, um, and in a way that also really engages with political philosophy rather than just throwing up uh, um, to, to say disrespectfully some some metaphors and then expecting that this is uh, um, in itself enough. So I think we, we need to, in the end, work through our uh, Western tradition also, um, and perhaps uh, post-humanists uh, like Haraway and others have not done that enough. Um, so um, this was the reflection that I did in the book uh, Green Leviathan. Um, this was directed towards uh, the, uh, the concept of uh, freedom, towards discussing what does freedom mean today in this, this context of, of AI and, um, and climate change. 
Um, uh, and that's just a small contribution to that because there's much more work um, uh, to be done there. Um, but I also looked in recent work, um, after writing Green Veritan, um, I looked at other political principles, including um, justice and democracy, uh, other theoretical concepts like power. Um, and so um, I here can already announce that, that yeah, I, um, you know, because I do think that, that it's really useful to use this, this kind of, um, um, yeah, <clears throat> political philosophical concepts like freedom, justice, democracy and power for, for thinking about AI and climate change. Um, uh, I, I've already done an exercise there, so I can announce here the book, The Political Philosophy of AI, because I think it's, um, it's very relevant in, in this context to, 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 um, yeah, to call for um, more people working on, on more principles uh, from political philosophy and relating that to um, uh, both uh, philosophy of technology and um, yeah, think, thinking about uh, humans and non-humans. And uh, so I think, yeah, you know, by this book, um, which is already finished, I, I, I have tried to also contribute to that. So, so Green Leviathan is part of this wider project of a political philosophy of AI and, and more widely a political philosophy of technology. Um, and I think there's much more work to be done uh, on that. And um, I'm really looking forward to um, further discuss this with you also and to, um, to further discuss some themes that you're interested in in particular um, and that could perhaps be related to some work I've done um, or that could you know, spark some, some more discussion among us um, and some, some brainstorming of how to um, um, yeah, relate some of your projects to, to this project of a political philosophy of technology, of AI, um, and to, to, um, to this yeah, more poetic um, understanding of politics that I've been presenting um, perhaps also this kind of thoughts about, you know, like what kind of ideological strug struggles we will have um, now in the 21st century around climate and how to best um, uh, conceptualize them um, and, uh, yeah, how to deal with them uh, from a philosophical point of view. I will stop here. Uh, thank you for uh, listening to my talk. Thank you very much, Mark. Wonderful, wonderful. Many, many questions. You touched in a wide range of topics and problems, um, which is uh, uh, almost impossible to, to account for all of them in, in a short period of time. But, um, well, I, I, of course, have some observations and uh, reflections or questions, but I will also leave for uh the participants to raise their hand if if they would like to make uh some common uh some comments um or a specific question but i i i may start okay so um you you um well it's it's very uh interesting uh what what you're doing uh because you're basically covering uh, the whole spectrum of um, political and ethical problems and dilemmas through the perspective of um, very contemporary issues of the use and the implications of technology, um, uh, um, artificial intelligence, and also uh, accepting the... Um, horizon of climate change okay so this is like a comment a, a, a small provocation um in in and, and i'll explain why regarding this acceptance of the climate change which, which is um uh, in the sense that we we um, we are from the generation, we, we, we are from the same generation, so we observe the escalade of this discourse 
uh, of um, uh, which was increasingly catastrophic and almost apocalyptic in the mm -hmm. sense that uh, we are very bad humans because we are destroying the planet and we need to take action. Um, uh, and we need to take action. We need to take action now. Um, and of course, today, 2021, we know that many of the catastrophic predictions uh, 20 years ago were false, were incorrect, were not um, uh, precise, right? Um, but uh, the, um, the spirit of, or the, the psych, even the psychological predisposition to accept this kind of, um, um, uh, this, um, the changes, the climate changes as the, um, the larger horizon where we, where we think about the conditions of possibility of politics in a sense that uh, it is impossible, it becomes impossible to maintain a traditional sense of politics, especially democratic politics, which, which is all, always concrete, national. Uh, it's impossible to keep this framework considering the um, global problems, as you as you mentioned um, at, at the end, right? So you have global global problems, and we we should have global solutions as well. Uh, so I would say that perhaps my first question, my first question, would be: um, To what extent uh, uh, should we um, uh, should we not question the imperative of this narrative of climate change? Okay, so I'm not saying that it, it has no um, justification or legitimacy in so far in, in, in so far it raises it touches concrete problems, but because we all see it. But I'm questioning. Um, uh, 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 one thing is to recognize there are problems in the environment, in the planet, uh, which which is indissociable from the the, the question of development of econ not only economic development, but we know that economic development is a con is a necessary condition for uh, human flourishing in the sense of the capabilities, right? So uh, there is it, it, we know that. We, if we, Brazil is a, is a good example on that, right? So we are in the 21st century, and only this year was uh, approved the mark, um, uh, the the law for um, uh, expanding um, uh, the treatment of water, right? So um, uh, uh, several millions of uh, almost half of Brazilian population does not did not have access to a treated water so we know that once we have this very basic thing from a european or western perspective that you have potable water you don't have the um the dejects uh, in open air and so forth this will bring um, development economic development prosperity it will have a direct impact in health um, of the populations and so forth. So um, I'm, I'm not. I'm not saying that there is a relationship. But my question is: Should we not question, uh, or sh should we blindly accept the urgency and the necessity of climate change as the, in with capital letters, as the? horizon from which we should uh, 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 project and uh, all, all other specific questions in terms of political, political, political and so forth. So this, this would be um, uh, uh, a first, a first question. So this would be a first question. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for the question. Um, yeah. It's true that I, I, um, 
I started from the premise that climate change is indeed an urgent problem and that there is a kind of climate crisis. So that was the premise. So if there is a climate crisis, right, then all these things, we, we really need to think about those things because then, then the authoritarian option in a way because becomes more attractive than, than it would normally be. And then these political problems, uh, political philosophical problems, also the underlying ones um, that I described with this, uh, the choices we have to make and so on, are more urgent and more, more important, more pronounced. Um, now, if it would turn out somehow scientifically and so on that it's not, um, that things would be less urgent, uh, or also if we would question a bit the kind of alarmism that have, there has been in the last um, decade, then I think we 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 could um, you know question the premise. Um, so I think it's a different discussion. I don't have a strong view on that uh, question, but we could question that premise. However, I think even if it were not the case that climate change is the main problem or something. Um, then it's highly likely that um, through the way the, we interact with the world as, as humans and as this particular kind of civilization uh, or civilizations, then, um, then I think it's highly likely that we will have other global problems. And we have also other global problems already. Um, so I think the, the kind of framework that I presented um, will also work more or less for, for different global threats and global problems. Um, and that's already for, for uh, yeah, if we think about what AI could do and so on. Um, so I, I think that it doesn't it's not necessarily a problem for me. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's of course important. I mean, I think we should be always critical and, and we can also question um, um, question the, the kind of the, the idea of the climate crisis. Um, it's not my project, it's not my mission to do so, um, but I think it's always good to remain critical about that. Um, the, the, that's for sure. I just start from the premise that we that this is indeed our horizon um, and, and, and that it, if it's not climate, then we anyway have a lot of environmental problems and global of a global nature, so we need to do something about this, and then the rest follows. Um, so, yeah, I, that that's my, my approach to that. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Well, well, I I I warned that it was a little bit provocative because I I I try to look for the the conditions of possibility for raising certain questions. So yeah. we know that forty years ago we wouldn't ask this question. Right. So the environment was arranged and prepared in order for the climate change, which didn't start it in this terminology. Right. Yeah, it was uh, mm -hmm. it, it changed. The discourse changes. So um, and especially. Uh, so I, I wonder what happened that allowed the introduction of this subject and also the progressive um, hegemonic weight in the sense that mm -hmm. everybody now talks and suddenly it became an, a global uh, it appears as having or as being a global imperative so i'm i'm, yeah. I'm always trying to but, but, but also, interesting question just very quickly as a philosopher of technology i would say social media play a very important role there and definitely. of course as a, as a person who also already lived in the 80s and 90s i i i i, I I'm somewhat surprised sometimes, yeah, that now suddenly everyone is environmentalist, whereas before it was already all known and and, and uh, really, you know, politically uh, environmentalists struggle to get there, you know. But this is no, no, ex exactly, uh, exactly. Yeah. So it's yeah. it's very interesting, and also because you pointed in something else, which is I think it's one of the the greatest one of the greatest problems. Then we will go to to the um, I, uh, in, uh, artificial intelligence, but which is this this tension between 
uh, an authoritarian uh, proposal of, well, let's, we have this global problems, we need global solution, therefore you need to, um, you need to be willing to give up your freedom mm -hmm. in order to preserve your life. Right. So uh, and so so basically, I, I would have two small questions um, under this horizon. The first is um, if if um, uh, by by including actually uh, the first is uh, you, you you mentioned uh, the relationship between uh, freedom and um, safety or survival, right? Or survival of the species. Uh, so I, I wonder if if the um, line of inquiry or approach to politics isn't um, like biopolitics extended. In so far, it, it it does not only concern. Uh, humans considered as populations, right? So in the pandemic, it became very clear that it's a matter of controlling populations. It's not about, of course, individual freedoms yeah. go through the, uh, through the window. They, they don't matter anymore because the population, the survival. Mm -hmm. But but it, it, it would be an expensive via politics in, in a second sense that uh, it 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 incorporates all the other forms of life that it's not necessarily human. Of course, when, when you include the uh, via Latour uh, things, mm -hmm. things are not alive, I, I, I imagine, I, right? So, so you would be including lives, all other forms of lives, and, and perhaps mm -hmm. we would need to and existence in general in the sense of it is the thing it's it's right mm -hmm. yeah so 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 this would be the first question isn't it a biopolitics and if it is a biopolitics an extended biopolitics uh what kind of politics can we really conceive in this scenario and and this relates to the second question that has to do with one of the things that you you your proposal of uh, we need to create a new common world a new common world mm -hmm. and um so i i would i would uh, adopt um uh, an Arendt's uh, perspective right so uh, uh, Arendt would not uh, be thrilled with uh, expanding the the political mm -hmm. to Right. So, but in a sense of, of the importance of human agency to constitute the world mm -hmm. and what, what it makes common, it's our participation in our engagement in the planet and we transform it in, into the world. So um, how can we imagine the creation of this new common world? Uh, dissociated from a sense of agency and intentionality. And, and this is a, um, uh, uh, an honest question uh, in the sense that uh, is it possible to, uh, to because it, with the artificial intelligence, for me, for instance, it, it's almost easier to grasp the possible meaning in the sense that um, we associated, we, we have a, um, an horizon, right, of, of reason, intelligence, uh, we can imagine intentionality, self, uh, even self-responsibility mm -hmm. in the sense of, uh, and consciousness and so forth. But if, if we include includes um, other forms of existence which uh, that do not have uh, intentionality and agency, how can we incorporate this X common? Yeah, very good questions. Um, so I, I do think that um, 
given the powers we have through technology, uh, we are really um, one of the main um, makers of the common world, right? And in that sense, have a huge responsibility there. And I, I do think we, um, to say that, that politics includes, for example, also uh, viruses like, like it does now. Um, I think the Latourian framework is very interesting there to, to uh, I mean, it needs further thought, what does it really mean? But, but I think it's, yeah, there's a really a very life, a life sense that it, politics today includes the coronavirus and its different variants. So that's true, but it, it doesn't mean that humans have no agency anymore or that, that it's not anymore important what they think. So um, we don't need a sort of flat ontology if that's what Latour would be after. Uh, mm -hmm. we, we need to recognize the, the, the particular place of humans in, um, in this poetic project. Um, so I don't have a problem with that. I, I, I think if there, like you know, metaphors like the compost heap, like 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 Haraway has for me, that's too, you know, making everything into one mm -hmm. you know, compost. That's that's for me uh, going too far in in uh, you know making everything um, too much the same somehow, or, or yeah, not recognizing the human. Uh, role. Uh, <clears throat> so I, I do think we have this kind of role, this, this poetic, uh, technic kind of role there. Um, uh, but, but yes, I mean, for me now, the, the virus is part of, of, of politics, <laughs> politic, and um, when, when we think about Foucault's term biopolitics, it's definitely biopolitics, and I was really surprised how fast it went that, that liberties were given up. Um, I, even if I agree with, with much that is happening, because I do think uh, it's a good thing, but, but, um, but not with everything. And I think that, that, you know, as a political philosopher, so to speak, I was really uh, uh, shocked by, by uh, how, how fast it went. And, and, and for me, it showed that also here in, in Europe, for example, uh, how, how vulnerable democracy is with a liberal democracy, right? Liberal yeah. democracy. Uh, so I, I think it's something to really take serious. Um, it, probably a biopolitics, we cannot avoid it because bio will be part of politics, just as yes. techno will be part of politics, right? We have this, uh, so the, the project I was talking about is inclusive in that sense. So I think we need to conceptualize on a descriptive level that, that technology and viruses and so on, that this is part of what politics is about today. Um, but then we have to decide this kind of, you know, what is justified and what is not justified. And there, I think the, this kind of framework from political philosophy with its principles and what does freedom mean and so on, uh, is really helpful. And so the, the book um, sometimes mentions also the pandemic. So pandemic is one of these other global problems and, and all the arguments in the book and, and the explorations are relevant to that problem too, uh, because you could argue, you know, there, that, that we've gone a bit of this Hobbesian route, right? And, and that, that it, I think it's very worrisome. And I think with the, with the concept of uh, flourishing and with, with other concepts that I call more this positive freedom, I think we could, maybe deal with it in a different way. Perhaps we have to take away some negative liberty based on Hobbesian argument of survival, but, but maybe we can also switch to, to thinking now about, yeah, a more, a more enabling kind of freedom um, and what that then means for the pandemic. Um, so I think, yeah, what I've presented um, can and should definitely also be, be used there um, to get out of this you know, sort of one-sided Hobbesian and, and also utilitarian uh, way of thinking about the pandemic. Yeah, great. Thank you, Mark. So uh, would anyone like to ask some questions?
because I can keep going. <laughs> Eduardo. Hi, good morning, Mr. Mark. Good morning, good morning teacher good morning. Marta. Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Eduardo. I'm guided for teacher Marta. Um, why? Uh, why are there? Yeah. Oh, I'm yeah. sorry. Is my uh, is uh, my uh, PhD student at the program of uh, sciences? So it's mm -hmm. just started. Nice to meet you. And then, nice to meet you too. While there are continuous uh, monitoring systems close to, to, to power plants capable of measuring CO2 emissions more directly, they do not have a global reach. This feature can be used uh, worldwide in places where there is no monitoring, for example, uh, uh, short, short countries. Uh, so, what are what are you think about this question? Uh, how mm. the uh, uh, AI could automate power plant image analysis to get regular emission updates? Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm I'm not a technical person, so I don't know the how in technical terms, um, but but I can imagine that. Um, yeah, more and more, it's 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 possible to combine data and to 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 collect data and analyze them by means of machine learning in such a way that um, we even don't have to know exactly what happens on the ground locally in a particular place. Um, but with AI, we we can more and more predict um, what's going to happen and and what the effect will be uh, globally. Um, because in a, in a sense, holistic thinking, ecological thinking means there, there's no merely local effect. So, um, and I think there AI can really um, help to, for uh, for the governance of um, uh, yeah em emissions and, and climate and, and energy use. Um, and of course, the the question of nuclear power plants is a, yeah, it's it's a very complex issue whether nuclear energy is the solution for uh, the climate crisis and so on. Um, I, I got a bit into that discussion in the beginning of my career when I worked actually in a, in a nuclear research uh, facility. And it's, yeah, I think the, the um, um, uh, you know, I can imagine that there are much more new technological possibilities now with AI and nuclear power um, but this, I think this needs to be seen then politically in this wider discussion of different energy sources. And um, I do also think that um, the, uh, the, the discussion nowadays, because of the climate crisis or you know, the political, political climate of, about climate, that, that, um, that the focus is too much on only about carbon. On, on carbon emissions. So yeah. I think carbon emissions are very important because I do believe there is a climate crisis and it's not a matter of belief. There is scientific evidence that, that there is a climate problem, right? Um, and then we can talk about how we frame it. But but I do think that, that um, um, yeah, I'm, I'm surprised as someone who knows also like environmental discussions from before that 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 now yeah politics is really one-sidedly focused on carbon emissions and in the case of nuclear energy of course we have to think about other factors too and and not just about carbon emissions right oh, all right uh, thank you very much thank you. yeah th th that's very curious because we 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 may ask exactly why we we already have a good solution which is nuclear nuclear energy we have the solution but this alarmist tone of the climate crisis say oh we have the solution but we don't want that solution mm -hmm. we don't want it yeah uh, which is uh, somehow irrational and we must ask why? Why uh, uh, is is the fear 
uh, of whatever explanations, perhaps not very sound explanations, um, uh, um, strong enough or heavy enough to, to justify that position. Mm -hmm. Well, th there's a lot of anxiety in our societies and, um, and that has to do um, not just with climate, but also with socioeconomic factors and with political mm -hmm. factors um, in the sense that, um, yeah, we, there are a lot of socioeconomic problems and that the fear stemming from this can also be projected on other issues. Um, however, I do think in the case of nuclear energy, we, we have to continue the discussion about that. I do think it's not irrational uh, to have fears there and emotions about nuclear energy. I think their arguments can be based on the, the risk of, of, of radiation, uh, which is small, but the consequences can be, can be huge. Uh, there's the, the risks associated with, with the, um, the, the storage of the, the, um, what, what, the, the, what comes out of the process, the, the, the radioactive material. Um, so the, 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 op the nuclear option is not um, a, a neutral one. It's also not politically neutral in the sense that it's often um, um, a very centralized kind of technology. So the politics related okay. to, to nuclear is, has been at least for always very centralized. It's the, yep. the state, the experts who decide and the, the people are not asked. So, so, so I have a lot of issues and questions there, right? But, um, but, but it is true that, um, yeah, that, that of course, that, that kind of discussion should be held and should not immediately be, be um, yeah, it should not be ignored or should not be immediately dismissed. The nuclear option should not be immediately um, ignored. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Would anyone, anyone would like to ask some other question? So just the last comment it, there, what you just mentioned that there, there's our society is very anxious about mm. many things. There, there is, there are some studies that show that um, uh, uh, this uh, uh, adherence uh, to um, uh, to this uh, narrative of um, apocalyptic narrative that mm. we are all going to die. Uh, it, of course, it has a direct implication in the mental health of, right? So that there are a lot of yeah. um, psychological uh, uh, problems derived from, from this. Yeah. But, but so I, I have a, a last question, but it's also uh, something that I've been uh, asking myself for a while now. Uh, which has to do, it's an hypothesis, right? The hypothesis that uh, perhaps we could explain this crisis in this general global anxiety, I would say, um, due to this displacement from, um, or, or, or we, we could see this climate crisis as the, uh, the maximum uh, example of uh, secularism, like mm -hmm. like secular movement that uh, radically uh, killed and overcome the killing of God in the sense of the transcendence. And because we are humans and we need, we search for some meaning to our lives. Mm -hmm. So there was this displacement from the transcendence to this somehow a spiritual um, dimension that, that grounded us, but also it elevated us to nature, right? Mm -hmm. So this, so nature uh, was redefined with uh, uh, deistic properties as if, as if, right? So we need, we, uh, uh, and I, we could we could do some kind of uh, exploratory research on even the our Judaic Christian tradition uh, and the, the the myth uh, and the mythological and the the millennial concepts that that still embody our ima imaginary mm -hmm. uh, and and see 
what happens in this shift? Are we are we reconceptualize sin, guilt, fault, um, punishment to ourselves because is it, 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 a, a, a daring and accepting this the most um, not everybody but I mean the most mm -hmm. apocalyptic narrative. It's also a, a, um, a sign of, oh, we have no value. There's something very wrong on us. So there's like a, a self punishment mm -hmm. and a, a, a individual punishment and a collective punishment as species. Mm -hmm. So this is this is like an, an hypothesis, but um, uh, perhaps per, perhaps this touches a more spiritual problem that one would acknowledge mm -hmm. or that one would be willing to acknowledge yeah. that that it's the meaning of our life the meaning of human existence yeah that, that, that's a great comment um i i love that um i i'm very interested in um, the relation between on the one hand um mental health and issues concerning the self and on the other hand, um, larger political issues, um, cultural narratives in our society and so on. And uh, I just have a book out on self-improvement, which also taps yes. a bit into that. But, but I would be really interested in, you know, um, collaborating on that or, like, you know, working more on that. I think there's so much more that needs to be done on this, this topic. Um, also with the existential side, you know, yes. it's very interesting. Um, so I hope to do that um, in, in the future um, and, and more of that. Um, yeah, and, and what you said about uh, the, the, the transcendence ideas and so on, and I was thinking of romanticism, of course. Uh, during the romantic times, nature is imbued with this kind of uh, godlike quality and um, yeah, and, and 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 more rationalistic frameworks like Spinoza are suddenly also today like interpreted in what I would call a very romantic way. So um, there is this tendency, and today one could say that um, yeah, that that this narrative about AI and the future of humanity, narratives about the climate climate apocalypse and so on. That this yeah, we try to make sense, of course. Uh, of our lives, and we uh, we long for transcendent uh, frameworks. We also, I think, um, <clears throat> in terms of like you know responding to what the postmodern writer said, we I do think we, we really need grand narratives, and we will always make them again. Yes, the grand narratives, and, and we, uh, so. But the question for me is then not to to just say like yeah we we, we should not have them. But, but to ask more the question, it's like with technologies, which technologies should we have? Which narratives do we need? Narratives about technology, narratives about the future of humanity. Um, and, and I think the current narratives presented by, by transhumanists, for example, are, are not the narratives that I think that we, you know, we should go for. Um, but, but that's the kind of discussions we should have. Well, well what kind of narratives we want? Um, but but uh, the, 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 the longing for transcendence the longing for meaning to our existence also um, are things that 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 cannot be replaced by something else and will always find new cultural and also indeed politically relevant uh, forms um, and it, it's very interesting to to discuss these and also how they influence how they I mean I, I do think that the current narrative of the climate crisis for example indeed influences um, like teenagers, for example, and, and their mental health influences um, people, how they make decisions about um, uh, buying things or not buying, about how they lead their lives. So I, I think it's very, um, yeah, it, it's much more um, sort of um, yeah, pervasive than we think, this influence of the, the larger political narratives and the, the cultural stories. Yes, it's a, it's an example of power in this in the Foucauldian sense, in the sense of a guiding conducts of creating the conditions for certain conducts to happen, like what you mentioned right in the beginning, the nudging, right? So you yes. you want to direct without imposing, 
right? Yeah. You want to give the impression that there is choice when mm. there's actually yes. not much because we know human psychology, right? But, exactly, uh, yes, about creating conditions. And also uh, conceptually, I like your remarks about conditions of possibility and so on. I think we need to look at sort of uh, deeper structures and not just only uh, always take the phenomena for granted, right? And, and, and it's that what we can do also here. And um, yeah, I think through uh, a kind of political thinking also in that sense, um, yeah, we, we can progress there. And, and I really like your critical uh, remarks. Wonderful, thank you so much, Mark. So, well, I, I, I hope that we can explore right this, this common intuitions. So, uh, so if, if nobody wants to ask any, anything else, I, I'm, I'm very happy, I'm very satisfied with the questions and the answers that I've got. I want to thank you very much again for uh, being willing to participate and to present your work. I think it's important, especially because also I recorded so other students and other people who mm -hmm. are interested, they, they will be able to get acquainted with your work. And mm -hmm. um, I, I wish and I hope um, that we can continue this collaboration in the future. And I really appreciate it. You have uh, you, you, the fact that you had the, the mm -hmm. time to, to do this, despite the you're going all over the place doing a, a million things. So thank you so much, Mark. It's a pleasure as usual. And, and let's stay in touch about these uh, kind of topics. Uh, I think it's, it's very, uh, very uh, intellectually stimulating to talk about this and, and to discuss uh, together. Okay. So take care, be well, and uh, we'll talk soon. Okay. Bye-bye, Marta and everyone. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you all. Thanks. Obrigada a todos.